coupled with a determination to thwart both the Trump agenda and the broader populist, I guess, or nationalist movement emerging around the globe. So they have these meetings in Google. They're weekly meetings known as, thank God it's Friday meetings. And it was sent to Breitbart News by an anonymous source. And so there's co-founders, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, VPs Kent Walker and Eileen Norton, CFO Ruth Porat and CEO Sundar Pichai. And uh, you can, we'll put a link below, you can watch it, it's worth watching the whole thing. And this is just after earlier this week, Google has admitted it tried to boost turnout among the Latino population to help Hillary Clinton, only to be dismayed as the usually solid Democratic voting bloc switched to the GOP in record numbers. And that's very interesting. So the way I think that it would work in terms of existing corruption approaches would be something like this. So if Google has tried to boost turnout among the Latino population, then what you would do is figure out how much that turnout was boosted and then figure out how much the Democrats would have had to pay to have that turnout increased. And then what you do is you consider that an in-kind contribution, right? So Google ads are very expensive. So if you want to get 100,000 or a million Latinos to go out and vote, well, that's, and you want them to vote a Democrat, then the Democrats would generally pay for that, right? So you have to figure out how much the voter turnout was boosted by Google's approaches and then consider how much the, the uh, Democrats, the DNC, would have had to pay for that at Hillary Clinton's campaign and then consider that an in-kind contribution. I'm going to assume it would be quite a lot of Benjamins and would be just a smidge above the very small limit that companies are allowed to donate, if at all. So the article goes on to say, these individuals who preside over a company with unrivaled influence over the flow of information can be seen disparaging the motivation, motivations of Trump voters and plotting ways to use their vast resources to thwart the Trump agenda. Co-founder Sergey Brin can be heard complaining, Trump supporters, oh, sorry, comparing Trump supporters to fascists and extremists. He argues that like other extremists, Trump voters were motivated by boredom, which he says in the past led to fascism. <laughs> communism, I shouldn't laugh, but the level of historical ignorance and made up thumb whackery is truly astounding. So then, given that Trump won, the Google co-founder then asked his company to consider what it can do to ensure a better quality of governance and decision making. In other words, the election did not go the way that we masters of the digital universe wanted it to go, so how can we fix that next time? Hmm. You know, there's that old movie when a stranger calls Spoiler, it's very old. There's this babysitter. She keeps getting calls. Have you checked the children yet? And finally, they trace the calls. And it's like, the calls are coming from inside the house. You know, there's all this fear that Russia affected or, or, or colluded to change the outcome of the U.S. election. I think the collusion is coming from inside the borders. <laughs> very sad. VP, VP for Global Affairs, Kent Walker, argues that supporters of populist causes like the Trump campaign are motivated by... Fear, xenophobia, hatred, and a desire for answers that may or may not be there. <laughs> now, if they are, in fact, looking for answers that may or may not be there, they might want to use Google because Google will show and hide things based upon, I believe, their political preferences. Later, Walker says that Google should fight to ensure the populist movement, not just in the U.S. but around the world, is merely a blip and a hiccup in a historical arc that bends toward progress, which is, of course, globalism, international socialism, and um, uh, the erasure of borders, which is harmful to rich countries, of course, because it's not like a lot of people in rich countries are dying to go move to third world nations. Not a lot of people relocating to Haiti. Well, or if they are, it's usually um, under the Clinton umbrella for nefarious purposes. So, Google, uh, oh, and, and in the, oh, we'll get to this. So there's some key moments here. Google co-founder Sergey Brin states that the weekly meeting is, quote, probably not the most joyous we've had, and that, quote, most people here are pretty upset and pretty sad. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> so Google has, I don't even know how many thousands of employees. Does Google have a roughly equal number of employees proportional to the Trump supporters in America. So close to half of Americans voted for Trump are half of Google employees in America pro-Trump. Well, if not, why not? You know, why not? If half the population was black, 
and there were almost no black employees at Google, everybody would be going insane. Now, your political beliefs are to some degree genetic. Just to some degree, who you are, what you want, small market, free market. It's one of the reasons why political dialogue doesn't really work as well as we like, because the only way to overcome genetic tendencies is with a ruthless uh, commitment to reason and evidence to overcome your natural hostility towards other political viewpoints. And so it is a form of genetic discrimination to keep Trump supporters out of your company. Uh, it is a form of genetic discrimination to keep Trump supporters out of your company. So then the question is, why in America are they having these meetings where they universally cry and wail and rend their garments and, and shred their hairdos over Trump getting into power? It's because, obviously, either A, they have no Trump supporters, which means they're weeding out people based upon political biases, which would strike me as kind of illegal, or B, they have Trump supporters who are all too terrified to speak up against the leftist cult that has taken over Google. Either way, that is one dysfunctional mess of an organization. So, uh, Bryn says the co-founder, Bryn says he is deeply offended by the election of Trump and that the election conflicts with many of Google's values. Now, apparently Google's values do not include diversity because of course you have to be a leftist, you have to be progressive, you have to toe the line or face the consequences, I suppose, as uh, James Damore found out. So trying to explain the motivations of Trump supporters, Senior VP for Global Affairs Ken Walker concluded, fear, not just in the United States, but around the world, is fueling concerns, xenophobia, hatred, and a desire for answers that may or may not be there. So xenophobia is fear of the other. So why don't you all have any Trump supporters making the case? Why don't you go talk to Trump supporters and ask why they voted for Trump? Hatred, well, the only hatred I see here is, you know, the left is always the same. Accuse other people of what you're actually doing, right? And so, yeah, the hatred and the xenophobia is very much coming from the executive board, in my humble opinion. Walker goes on to describe the Trump phenomenon as a sign of, quote, tribalism that's self-destructive in the long term. <laughs> you, mean, you mean like wanting socialism and not having any capitalists in your pretend capitalist company? <laughs> company? Come on. Tribalism that's self-destructive in the long term. Ah, like Venezuela. Okay, so then you get, the moment people say bends towards progress, and, and the word thrive is another one of these people just use this word thrive, it's not an argument. <clears throat> so, the, wor the world of the wall, with its isolation and defensiveness, and the world of the square, the piazza, the marketplace, where people come together into a community and enrich each other's lives. So the world of the wall, see, the wall is where you keep out people who are different from you. <laughs> you get out insane. No self-knowledge whatsoever, right? He approvingly quotes former Italian PM, blah, blah, blah. He says, well, the world of the wall is bad. The world where you keep out people who are unlike you is bad. So where are the Trump supporters in your audience? Where is the robust debate? Where is the diversity of opinion? Where is the community and enrichment and, and diversity of opinion? It's not there because on the left, they don't care about diversity at all. The only diversity they care about is they welcome all diverse cultures that vote for the left. CFO Ruth Porat appears to break down in tears when discussing the election results. <laughs> There's no crying in finance. <laughs> what do you even say? She's crying about, are you okay? This drama and drama and drama, right? Porat promises that Google will, quote, use the great strength and resources and reach we have to continue to advance really important values. <laughs> so uh, those really important values were the election of Hillary Clinton. So an in-kind contribution should be judged and adjudicated as such. CFO Ruth Porat states, we all need a hug. And then she instructs the audience of Google employees to, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so mad, to hug the person closest to them. Unless it's a Trump supporter, in which case you can take out your bike locks and your shadow banning. Just kidding. Oh, we all need a hug. <laughs> That's what you want in your CFO. Ah, huggy, huggy, huggy. All right. Eileen Norton, VP of People Operations, promises that Google's policy team in D.C. is, quote, all over, end quote, the immigration issue, and that the company, quote, keep a close watch in it. Huh, I wonder if people in the audience are benefiting from open borders 
In other words, I wonder if there are any managers there that get employees on the cheap through H-1B visas. I wonder if there's any business reasons behind this. <clears throat> Norton jokes about Google employees asking, can I move to Canada after the election? She goes on to seriously discuss the options available to Google employees who wish to leave the country. Now, that's always interesting to me. When leftists get mad at America because they consider it to be like racist and xenophobic and just probably too white and too full of white privilege, they always talk about moving to Canada. In other words, to a country that's even whiter than America, with fewer minorities than America, at least for now. Why do they never talk about moving to Venezuela or Brazil or Mexico or Haiti, you know, where the cost of living is a lot cheaper and you get a lot of cultural enrichment all over the place? Oh, why do they want to move to a whiter country as their country gets browner? Very strange. Oddly racist in my particular perspective. Norton does acknowledge diversity of opinion and political persuasion and notes that she has heard from conservative Google employees who say they haven't felt entirely comfortable revealing who they are and urged tolerance. And, of course, a couple of months after this, James Damore was fired. So, yeah, we urge tolerance. Uh, how, how about, you know, what you could do if, if you genuinely wanted tolerance is you could invite conservatives up there to make the case, to, to help, you know, understand the other, understand Trump, understand their supporters, what's interesting. You know, you could, you could uh, sponsor that kind of stuff. You could have uh, conservatives come in and give presentations, lots of different things. But, of course, it's a, it's a you know, I mean, it's, it's very distantly analogous to the let a thousand flowers of thought bloom under Chairman Mao, who was like, yeah, we invite criticism of the regime. And it's like, you and you and you and you and you criticized the regime show, off you go to the gulags. So, yeah, Bryn then compares Trumps to extremists and, and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, it's just nasty. So an employee asks Google at one point if Google is willing to, and I quote, invest in grassroots, hyper-local efforts to bring tools and services and understanding of Google products and knowledge so that people can, quote, make informed decisions that are best for themselves. Uh, Pichet's response, Google will ensure its educational products reach segments of the population they are not currently fully reaching. So then, of course, this fake news shared by low-information voters, and what that means is counter-socialist narratives shared by people who know how the hell the world works. He says that, quote, investments in machine learning and AI are a, quote, big opportunity, end quote, to fix the problem. Now, just before everyone goes kind of nuts and says, my God, we all thought it was going to be robot skulls with machine guns mowing us down. It turns out the real dominance of the machines is the AI and the blah, blah, Skynet. Ah, it's nonsense. Listen, I started learning how to program computers when I was 11. I was a professional computer programmer. I headed up a research and development department. I was chief technical officer of a software company for many, many, many years. Computers only do what you tell them to. There's no magic with new computers. They're faster, but they're not different. Computers only do what you tell them to do. They're completely passive, dumb machines. They will only learn in the parameters that you tell them to learn. So this idea that somehow the machine is going to learn and just oddly end up left wing is nonsense because you say, oh, look out for this term. This is fake news. Well, if it's a term usually associated with conservatism, then you're just programming the computer to mimic the prejudices of a socialist. So machine learning and AI, AI is not the enemy. Uh, the computers are just dumb appliances doing exactly what they're told. They have no thoughts of their own. They can't learn on their own. They can only develop new decision trees based upon inputs from existing coders. <clears throat> so just be aware of this, right? Um, at one point, a Google employee states, speaking to white men, there's an opportunity for you right now to understand your privilege and urges employees to go through the bias busting training, read about privilege, read about the real history of oppression in, your con in our country. He urges employees to discuss the issues you are passionate about during Thanksgiving dinner, and don't back down and laugh it off when you hear the voice of oppression speak through metaphors. And everyone applauds the employee. So, you know, just so everyone knows, the concept of white privilege is a purely racist construct. And it puts all whites in one big category, and it says that whites are somehow massively privileged and so on. And it is a massive, bias, bigoted, horrible, false narrative. The best that you could possibly say is there's such a thing as majority privilege. You know, when you go to Japan and everything's kind of built for Japanese people, that's not Japanese privilege. That's majority privilege, and it exists and occurs all over the world. But uh, it is uh, horrible, and it is a way, of course, of telling white people 
to be quiet. And it's a way of suppressing the voices of white people by labeling them privileged and therefore telling them to not speak. So an audience member asks, if the executives see, quote, anything positive from this election result, now that's what you call a trial balloon. In other words, is there any possibility that we can speak rationally about this or objectively about this, or is this going to be lefty culty hysteria from here to eternity? So is there anything positive? And everybody bursts into laughter and laughed. Boy, that's a really tough one right now, says Bryn. So shut up if you're a conservative and, and take it. So after this article was published, Google spokesperson replied and said, at a regularly scheduled all hands meeting, some Google employees and executives expressed their own personal views in the aftermath of a long and divisive election season. For over 20 years, everyone at Google has been able to freely express their opinions at these meetings. Nothing was said at that meeting or any other meeting to suggest that any political bias ever influences the way we build or operate our products. To the contrary, our products are built for everyone and we designed them with extraordinary care to be a trustworthy source of information for everyone without regard to political viewpoint. I guess I'll just let you judge that for yourself. But um, yeah, this is a mess. I mean, they're, in my view, basically admitting to uh, interfering and wanting to interfere and wanting to change the outcomes of elections. Well, that's called 